Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the government puts out propaganda on one channel. TV adverts air repeatedly. And pulls the plug on media it doesn't like. Election time in Honduras. Life through a lens, the best news photographs of 2008. Saddam Hussein makes a comeback on his own television channel. And Bohemian Muppets do the Fandango on the World Wide Web. On November 29th, voters in the Central American country of Honduras went to the polls, electing a new president, Porfirio Lobo, of the National Party. This was no ordinary election. The previously elected president, Manuel Zelaya, was thrown out of office in a military coup in June. The coup leaders then installed their man, Roberto Micheletti, into the job. Neither Zelaya nor Micheletti was on the ballot this time around. Regional powers, Brazil and Argentina, are refusing to recognize the election as legitimate, but the United States is. That's the politics, but there's also a big media angle to this story. Across Latin America, the political left and right are battling for power. The media are central to the fight and have had a huge influence on how news stories like that of the coup in Tegucigalpa have been told. Our starting point this week is Honduras, the illegal overthrow of a president, the lockdown of the domestic media outlets the coup leaders do not approve of, and the international reporting of a story that not everyone understands. We begin in Honduras, where the country's elections are in full swing. The coup leaders have manipulated the message coming out of the media. For the last five months, two men have been claiming the title of president here. In order to control that message, you've got to control the media. Roberto Micheletti's de facto government says the vote is the only way to move Honduras out of its political crisis. There had been a lot of concern about just how fair and free these elections could be. An opponent of the ousted Honduran president has won the race to become the next leader. They're clearly interested in suppressing the real news. Conservative opposition candidate Porfidio Pepe Lobo easily won. Voters in this election had a choice between two candidates for president, both of whom supported the coup that threw Manuel Zelaya out of office. All the other nominees pulled out, most of them over allegations of intimidation and fraud. However, the electorate would not necessarily have known that because the Honduran news media, at least what was left of it after the coup, was not free to report what was happening. There's absolutely a media war being carried out by the Honduran oligarchy. Domestically, they're using straight-up state terror techniques to suppress the media. There have been several cases of journalists being arrested illegally detained, then released, but you know, that creates an atmosphere of fear among the journalists and the great censorship. They have silenced the national media, they have repressed internal journalists, they have abused power, and they have used every method at their disposal to prohibit all channels of communication. The remainder of the media stations in Honduras are owned by the coup leaders themselves. They've used these media outlets as pure propaganda. France's English language news channel, France 24, recently documented the tale of two media outlets, state-funded television Anarquia, criminalidad y brutalidad en un gobierno déspota que pregonó Manuel Zelaya Rosal and a channel that opposed the coup. And here's what you might see if you switch on channel 36. A blank screen has replaced the pro Zelaya channel since September 28th, when soldiers raided the channel at dawn. And the state-funded channel runs ads promising that the government will protect the Honduran people. Hoy, la población puede estar segura y tranquila. La Policía Nacional y el Ejército están para protegernos. Han dosificado la información they have manufactured the information that the world receives and restricted the flow of information that feeds international channels. They have invented facts and they've used television channels that are sympathetic to their cause to air them. TV adverts air repeatedly, exhorting Hondurans to go to the polls for the good of peace and democracy. They're acutely aware of how important it is to control the message. And they have worked extremely hard to you know, attack and threaten any of the media people there 
who try to make the rest of the world aware of what's happening. International media watch groups like Reporters Without Borders and the Committee to Protect Journalists condemned the way coup leaders and the political leaders they installed treated the Honduran media. Following the closure of stations Canal 36 and Radio Globo, the CPJ said, Honduran citizens have the right to be fully informed about what's going on in the country at this very sensitive moment. We urge the interim government to respect journalists' right to report the news freely. The two primary stations that remained after they had shut down all of the other opposition media stations were accused of media terrorism. They're back on again now, but under great threat to the journalists themselves. The forces as associated with the ousted president have not been able to either campaign or to express themselves. The curtailing of freedom of expression has been also about political expression in addition to freedom of the media. Honduran citizens have been getting involved in the media side of the story as well, turning out at radio stations like this one to show their support. However, there is a flip side to that, and Al Jazeera's Lucia Newman has experienced it. We were having an interview. We had a guest, a live guest, and we were broadcasting from the center where the elections were being tallied at a downtown hotel. And when some of those people who supported the coup heard what she was saying, the woman was mobbed. Uh, they surrounded her, screamed at her. And it became really, really scary at one point. We had a difficult time getting her out of the hotel. Chavez, llama a la Chavez is inciting violence. Among the storylines the international news media have been sending out of Honduras is the idea that Manuel Zelaya is ideologically joined at the hip with that other Latin American leader, Hugo Chavez of Venezuela. That angle has found a particularly receptive audience in the U.S. This guy is acting extra-constitutionally. Yes, he was elected, but Hitler was as well, and Chavez also was. The media has refused to cover really what's happening, and again, they just paint this picture of we need to protect ourselves from Hugo Chavez. Zelaya is a radical who declared himself a socialist in 2007 and has been destroying his country's prospects for growth. Hugo Chavez is one of his closest political allies and his role model. In the Honduras. There is an interest to paint what is happening in Honduras as a fight between the right and the left, between the Chavismo and the non-Chavismo. But in reality, that is not the problem. The deeper problem, the bottom line, is a choice between democracy and dictatorship. They have a saying in Honduras, when the media shut up, when the media fail to or are not free to speak up, the walls will shout. That's why there's so much graffiti around. It's citizen journalism, old school and offline, for Hondurans who want their voices heard and their story told. Here's how our Global Village Voices see the coverage of Honduran politics. The international media coverage of the crisis in uh, Honduras, in my opinion, has missed the main point. And that is that there was a coup in Honduras. The democratically elected president, uh, Mel Zelaya, was removed by military personnel and taken away from the country. Uh, most of the media coverage has tried to provide a justification for that, saying that Zelaya brought it on to himself, that he wanted to uh, be a president for life and a whole number of things like this, in order to try to cover up the fact, the very basic uh, fact, that there was a coup in Honduras. The media has been very biased, either for or against Manuel Zelaya. They've been very polarized. And also, they are very politicized. They're trying to get people to believe their side of the issue, and only their side of the issue. I think the media needs to give us the truth, and not what we want to hear as consumers, or what you think we want to hear, or uh, what the editors want us to believe. No, this is not acceptable for journalists. We've now got more than 3,500 viewers following us on Facebook and Twitter. They check in to find out what stories we're working on in case they want to weigh in as one of our Global Village voices. You can do the same, or you can just get in touch with us via email. We're waiting to hear from you at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. Iraqis celebrating the first day of Eid al-Adha, one of the most important holidays on the Islamic calendar, were in for a surprise when they turned on their television sets. A new channel mysteriously appeared, celebrating the memory of former President Saddam Hussein. The channel started broadcasting on the third anniversary of Saddam's execution. 
For three days, it aired images of Saddam and his family mixed in with speeches and Saddam reciting poetry, the same kind of material Iraqi TV routinely aired under his rule. Then the channel disappeared from screens just as suddenly as it had arrived. There are all kinds of rumors as to who is behind the channel and where it broadcasts from. The theory centered on members of Saddam's old bath party, and the speculation is that the channel was beaming its signal out of Damascus. The attempted assassination of a leading Iraqi television reporter has the International Federation of Journalists accusing the government in Baghdad of scandalous negligence for turning a blind eye to the killing of so many media workers. Imad Alibadi, the director of Al Dr TV, is reported to be out of intensive care now and in stable condition after being shot in the head, neck, and chest. Alibadi is a prominent critic of the American occupation of Iraq, the security apparatus there, and he has exposed what his channel called financial corruption in the office of President Nouri al Maliki. More than a year after being kidnapped and after having a hefty ransom paid on their behalf, two journalists have been freed in Somalia. Canadian reporter Amanda Lindout and Australian photographer Nigel Brennan were abducted in August 2008 and held for 15 months before being released and flown out of the country to Kenya. According to a report in Agence France Press, one of the kidnappers claimed that a million dollars in ransom had been paid. News reports out of Canada said that Lindout's family had remortgaged its home to raise some of the money. Now reports suggest their release could have cost their families up to $700,000. And hired a private security firm to handle the negotiations. Initially, most media outlets agreed not to publicize the story of the kidnapping. That changed when, according to Lindout, she was forced by her captors to phone news organizations in order to convince the Canadian government to pay the ransom. Another sign, as if we needed one, of troubled times in the U.S. newspaper industry. The Washington Post, one of America's most influential papers, the publication that broke the Watergate story and brought down a president, is shutting down all of its U.S. bureaus outside the D.C. area. Bureaus in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago will be closed by the end of this year as part of the paper's plan to cut costs because of falling circulation and advertising revenues as readers seek the news online for free. The Post says it will concentrate its remaining resources on covering politics and local news. The U.S. newspaper industry is shrinking significantly. Papers such as the Boston Globe, the Baltimore Sun, and the San Francisco Chronicle are among those in real trouble. We're back after the break with a piece on award-winning photojournalism. Still images that bring news stories to life. Welcome back. This award-winning photograph of a man in a uniform wielding a gun, making his way carefully through an apparently empty house, is not what it appears to be. It's not from a war zone, and it's not a drug bust. The image won first prize in the World Press Photo Awards for 2008 because it brought home the impact of the global recession and what it meant for one household and for one policeman. The picture was shot by photographer Anthony Suau, and it tells a story. The Listening Post's Minakshi Ravi caught up with the World Press Photo Awards traveling exhibition in London, where she took in Suau's picture and 62 other photos that captured the story of 2008. The city of Mumbai under attack. It's very tense and there is terror on Mumbai streets. It's been simmering for years and in the past 24 hours it's erupted. Fierce fighting in the breakaway region of South Ossetia. What is the time? It's gone! Will you say far down you? Being a judge on the panel of the World Press Photo Awards has its benefits. A chance to see the work of some of the world's best photographers, to discuss photos that most of the world hasn't seen. The challenge? Try selecting one photo out of a total of 96,268 submissions as the defining image of the year. That's what the judges of the World Press Photo Awards had to do in 2008. Here you've got most of the big stories of 2008 captured here in some form or other, and most of them, most of them are prize winning. Big set piece news events like the Olympics in Beijing and the presidential campaign in America dominated the news cycle in 2008. But the prize winning photo captures a moment from the one news event that few predicted and almost no one could media manage. It reminds me of the Middle East. I've seen things like that in Palestine or Israel or um, Afghanistan. But you know, you take a closer look and it's Ohio. The man in the photo is a policeman. The house he's walking through has just been repossessed. Its owners evicted for failing to make their mortgage payments. 
the policeman is searching the property to make sure it's empty, safe and free of booby traps. It's difficult to photograph an economic crisis. And then I think what he has managed to achieve with these pictures is that uh, he has brought it to a human level. It almost looks like a picture that could be taken in a war song. It's probably the best picture to illustrate the story of the credit crunch, of how it's affecting individuals as well as big business. It's good photojournalism, the photographer is, is right in amongst it. I think it's probably the best photo I saw last year to illustrate that particular subject. But the biggest story of 2008 was the American presidential elections, and Barack Obama probably had more lenses trained on him than any other person on the planet. During the campaign, everybody wanted the latest pictures of him. Everybody wanted to be, to be part of it. It was not dissimilar from mania surrounding giant pop groups. Everything is controlled, though. The politicians are so media savvy. President Obama, also back then when he was a candidate, he knew exactly what he was doing. And the images we see are uh, lively and, and they look real. They are real, but most of the times, is a game between the politicians and the media. Photographer Kali Shell had privileged access to the Obama story. Kali Shell has been following the Obamas when no one knew who Obama was. He had incredible access to the family, to his home in Chicago, and that made it a really special body of work. But it was always that kind of access that she has got that many other photographers didn't get. What you're looking for is anything that is, that is different, that is refreshing, that gives a glimpse behind the scenes. And Kelly's pictures of, uh, do exactly that. The Beijing Olympics was the other big story of 2008. The photos taken there dominate the award sports category. This series of shots taken at a diving competition look deceptively easy to shoot. But when it comes to sport photography, it's about the action. It's about just capturing that specific moment, the action shot. Uh, things are happening so fast. You really have to have the training and the experience and lots of trial and error to accomplish the effect you really want to have. In this series of pictures, he placed lots of these, so it's like a repetition, it's like a, a moving image, uh, but there are different athletes jumping from the 10 meters platforms. But the Olympics wasn't China's only big story that year. As the country prepared for the games and the arrival of the global media, a major earthquake shook the province of Sichuan. Down in the quake-damaged valley of Beichuan, rescuers had been racing against time to save lives. Chinese photographer Chen Qingang was working for the Hangzhou Daily. The photo he took of a survivor being rescued is captivating. The color, the composition, the light, and the action, it's all there. Steve Winter is an American photographer. His photographs of snow leopards in the Himalayas were difficult to get. The big cats are elusive and easily scared off. The photographer here used the camera traps where the cat actually activates a beam and the picture is shot by the camera itself. So the photographer is not even there. It's pure chance. Sometimes it will work, like here, which is spectacular. Some others, it won't work. Unique as they are, the photos taken by camera traps are not new to the World Press Photo Awards. What has been a fresh theme over the past few years has been the widening geographical spread of the participants and prize winners. From Indian photographer Sebastian D'Souza's camera came some of the most newsworthy shots of the Mumbai terror attacks. And Chinese photographer Bo Bor captured striking images of the aftermath of the earthquake in Sichuan province. It's very strong when it's your own country. We are very used as photographers to uh, travel to other areas, but we always come back home, so it's very powerful. I think it's quite important that the photographers that are entering comes from all corners of the world, so that make it really global. I can't think of any other event that at the moment is fulfilling the same criteria. And the most important criterion of them all Images that tell a story. More Global Village Voices now on the power of pictures. Regarding the 2008 winning picture, I think it's a tremendous piece of photography that shows the, uh, the 
uh, economic difficulties that we have all experienced throughout the world and sort of the, uh, the uncertain approach by uh, our government represented by the policeman who is looking for people in the house and um, he's, he's a tiny bit of order surrounded by chaos. The detective's look of caution in that photo is analogous to the uncertainty of world markets that caused so many foreclosures and financial turmoil. For 2009, I would expect photos from this summer's election fallout in Iran to provide a defining image for the year. The bombardment of photography from protesters in Iran produced stunning imagery, such as the iconic martyr Netta or swarms of Iranians clad in green storming the streets of Tehran. Finally, seven million hits on YouTube in less than a week. That's the kind of web traffic that gets our attention. This video is a viral phenomenon, but really, only the medium is new. It's by the Muppets, the late Jim Henson's troupe, who are celebrating their 40th anniversary, and they've done it with their version of a song that's 34 years old. They've gone bohemian. They may have changed the lyrics, but there's no mistaking the original. The Muppets cover a classic Queen track. It's our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post.